Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Lunchbox Science. Uh, my name is Tom Gordon from the School of Physics. Uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Bedigal and Wongal people of the Eura Nation, where I am, uh, where you are, of course, and finally throughout Australia. I'd like to recognise their continuing connection to land, water, culture, and pay respects to their elders past, present and future. We're going to have a lovely presentation for you today, and you can start leaving some questions in the Q&A tab, uh, where we'll get to some of those questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Zden Zdenka Kunchik, and it's my absolute privilege to introduce her to you. Uh, Zdenka is a professor of physics in the School of Physics and was also a future scholar. Her highly interdisciplinary research brings physics and physics-based approaches to help gain new insights into challenging problems. In today's webinar, Zdenka is going to explain how physics can help to better understand natural intelligence and the implications for AI and artificial general intelligence. So I would now like to hand over to Zdenka for Is Intelligence Physical? Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us uh, today. So um, I'm going to uh, give you, a, I guess, a, a, an introduction and an overview of one of the research projects I'm working on here at the University of Sydney. And uh, as you can tell from the title, it involves artificial intelligence, although not directly. It also involves a little bit of neuroscience and a little bit of nanotechnology. But most of all, it actually involves physics. So let me get started. So the brain has often been described as the most complex thing in the entire universe. We know more about some of the most distant galaxies in the universe than we do about the brain. In particular, some of the things that we know very little about, which neuroscientists are working very hard on, are things like, well, how, do we, how, do, how are we able to remember things? How are we able to learn? And most importantly, how are we, how are we able to think? This is one of the reasons why AI has become so popular, because AI shows us that it's actually possible to emulate some of the features that we recognise as intelligence. So, um, of course, everyone's heard of AI now because it's having such an impact across so many different uh, areas in our society. Everything from more social networking apps to assembling IKEA furniture, to crafting pickup lines. In fact, in many areas where AI has an, had an impact, it actually outperforms what humans can do. For example, facial recognition, the, the way in which AI is able to do that with vast amounts of data is something that we can't do. So you could already argue that AI in some respects already exhibits superhuman abilities. But there's a lot of things that AI can't do. And some of that has been revealed uh, in, in many different ways. Um, in particular, the way in which the human brain is able to process information is quite different from the way in which AI works. More specifically, when, when we take in information through sensory input, so either uh, visual through our eyes or when we smell or taste something, that's continuously being processed by our brains. And more importantly, the way in which we do that is very, very dynamic. We're able to constantly adjust to our ever-changing environments. And that's something that AI can't actually do. So AI is really uh, a type of processing of data that is applied to a very specific task. So it can't be generalised to a broad range of tasks. So in order to better understand the difference between artificial intelligence and the type of intelligence that is characterised by what our brains do, let's have a little bit of a closer look at how AI works. So here's a very uh, simple uh, example, or at least you know, the simplest example that I've been able to find. So what we're looking at here 
is a whole bunch of what are called um, networks. And in this case, a collection of networks assembled in a layer as so. And these type of networks are called artificial neural networks. These artificial neural networks are mathematical constructs that AI algorithms use. And they're called artificial neural networks because they're loosely based on the real networks of neurons in our brains. So if you think, if you look at these squares, for example, these squares are meant to represent neurons or artificial neurons. And all these connections that join them up in each layer resemble artificial synapses. So in an AI model, this is all coded up in an algorithm and data is fed into it. And then these artificial synapses are constantly adjusted um, in order to produce an output uh, that's, uh, that's desired for the particular task. So if the particular task is to uh, recognize a particular type of image, say, recognize uh, what a cat, an image of a cat looks like. So that type of data needs to be fed into the artificial neural network model. Uh, and then the output is something where um, if you put in uh, other images of cats, it would instantly recognize it. Now, in order for that to work, you need a lot of what's known as training data. So a lot of different pictures of cats. And then those different pictures of cats are fed into the neural network um, over and over again. And then those synapses, the artificial synapses, are optimized to recognize a cat. So after this um, AI is trained, if you then showed it another arbitrary picture of a cat, it should be able to recognize it as a cat. Now, one of the big limitations of these uh, types of AI models that are based on artificial neural networks is that they only really work if you've got a lot of data and if the data is really high quality. So for example, if after you've trained this particular artificial neural network AI model to recognize a picture of a cat, if, you're, if, you're, if the data that you've used to train the AI isn't good enough, it won't be able to train the cat. Uh, or recognize the image of a cat. So for example, if you, if you instead uh, used data that was based on images of people, you'd get something that ends up like this, a bit of a mishmash of what you wanted the AI model to do, uh, but then uh, it fails when you feed in data that doesn't correspond to what it's been optimized to do. Now, of course, the brain doesn't work this way we're able to continuously take in all sorts of data from our surroundings, and we're able to, in real time, triage that information in such a way that we're able to recognize things and differentiate things um, uh, continuously in real time. So this tells us that there are some fundamental differences between how AI and artificial neural networks work and how the real neural, neural network in the brain works. And here are some three key uh, differences. So the first difference is that the real neural network in our brains is made of hardware. It's made of neurons, real neurons, and real synapses. And um, the synapses connect the neurons together. The second point of difference is that the real neural network in the brain doesn't need algorithms. So every time we're trying to interpret something that we experience in our environments, we don't need to sit down and write a piece of code and feed that into our brains. Our brain somehow does this automatically. So we're able to process uh, information dynamically on the fly without having to have different uh, versions of uh, algorithms. And the third difference is that uh, the brain can adapt to changing inputs. So it possesses what's known as general intelligence. The fact that um, we don't have to uh, adjust ourselves in order to understand a whole range of different inputs. This is something that AI at the moment cannot do. So as I mentioned before, 
AI is really good at doing highly specific tasks, very specialised tasks, and an AI model is trained for that specific task. Once that AI model is trained for that task, if you then wanted to apply it to learn something else, so instead of being trained to recognise cats, for example, you wanted to see if it can recognise dogs, you'd have to start from scratch and create a new model and train that new model. So AI doesn't have this, this property known as general intelligence. And in fact, the, um, the idea of artificial general intelligence is an active area of research today in, in AI. So let's look at a little bit more closely um, at neural networks and in particular what neuroscience tells us about neural networks. So from all the research that's been done in neuroscience, we, we get an image of real neural networks that looks something like this. Neurons or the cells, um, and they have these really long extensions um, that emanate out from them. And these long extensions called ax axons and dendrites, they're, they're responsible for the synapses. So they reach out to neighboring neurons and they're able to communicate with each other through these long extensions. So the network structure of real neural networks is very, very complex. But what's also important in real neural networks, in addition to their network structure, are the synapses. The synapses are responsible for how neurons communicate with each other. So I'll just show you this quick video that really illustrates uh, how synapses communicate with each other, how we think they communicate with each other uh, in the brain. So um, we receive a whole bunch of sensory inputs from our surroundings and those sensory inputs are immediately converted into electrical signals. And those electrical signals then trigger uh, a whole slew of biochemical reactions that occur in neurons. And the neurons then are also able to transmit that even further by um, uh, transmitting very specific molecules called neurotransmitter molecules, which can be transmitted from one neuron to another, as shown here. So you can see the individual molecules going from one neuron to the other. And this is occurring all the time uh, in the brain in response to continuous inputs of, of sensory inputs. And not only that, the volume of the signal is really impressive. So the brain has some uh, trillion neurons, so that's 10 followed by 12 zeros, and we think that there's about a thousand times more synapses between those neurons, so that's 10 with 15 zeros behind it. So the question that I'm, I've really been asking is, can we emulate the sort of natural intelligence that the brain exhibits? by building a physical neural network with synapses. So instead of an artificial neural network that's made with software, can we make something with hardware? So I'll show you something that we've come up with. We've actually used nanotechnology to create a structure that looks remarkably similar to the network structure in the real neural network in the brain. And the way in which we've been able to do this is using nanotechnology. Now I say we because um, I've been collaborating with uh, colleagues in Japan and the US to create this type of new nanotechnology. So it's certainly not something that um, I've come up with by myself and this has been uh, work that's been developed over a number of years. So let me just explain what you're looking at here. All these um, crazy looking uh, extensions here are metallic nanowires. So they're wires that are about uh, five nanometers in diameter, but they can be much, much longer than that. And everywhere that the nanowires cross each other forms an electrical junction. And what that means is that when you stimulate this network of nanowires with uh, an electrical input, 
That electrical signal can be transmitted throughout the network in much the same way that electrical signals are transmitted throughout the real neural network in the brain. Now, the reason why we've used nanotechnology to make this is because when you shrink things down to nanoscales, they, these uh, materials start to exhibit different physical properties. And in this case, the metallic wires that we've used to create nanowires start to exhibit very unique electrical properties. So it's those unique electrical properties that enables us to emulate the electrical signal transmission through this network. But more importantly, the way in which these nanowires can self-assemble into this network structure is also an important and crucial property that arises from using this type of nanotechnology. So let me explain how it works a little bit more. So as I mentioned, um, we, can stimulate, uh, we can stimulate the network with uh, different electrical signals. And because of the network structure, the network self-regulates in terms of how those electrical signals are transmitted through the network of nanowires. Now, between the nanowires, where they overlap, there's also a little junction um, which, acts, which acts like a synapse. So the electrical signals run up and down nanowires and then cross each other at these junctions. Again, very much like a synapse. And what goes on at these synapses between the nanowires is that because there's an electrical junction, we get migration of atoms from one wire to another, very similar to the way in which neurotransmitter molecules are transmitted from one neuron to another. So in this neuromorphic nanowire network, we can actually emulate how electrical signals are transmitted um, across the neural network with, uh, with synaptic connections that is analogous to the way in which we think uh, signals are transmitted through a real neural network. So on the right hand side here is what we think a real biological neural network looks like. And we see these pictures chiefly from all the research that's been done in, in neuroscience. Um, and neuroscience tells us one really key important point, which is um, the, the intricate connection between structure and function in neural networks, which is, means to say that uh, the neural network topology is absolutely critical to the cognitive function that emerges from the neural network. So this is really key um, for emulating uh, features and, um, and properties that start to resemble natural intelligence. And one really important aspect of that is the ability for this type of network to adapt to changing input signals. So we've also um, modelled the physics of how these signals are communicated in our nanowires. This shows a simulation of the nanowires and also the blue circles represent the junctions or the synapses between the nanowires. And if you look closely, you would have seen some of these blue circles sort of changing colour. And that indicates that the synapse is turned on and signal has been transmitted from one nanowire to another one through the synapses. You can also see, if you look closely, some white arrows. And those white arrows indicate where uh, the electrical signals have chosen to propagate from uh, one side of the network where an electrical uh, signal has been um, uh, stimulated there across to the other side. Now, what's really important here and what makes this completely different from artificial neural networks is the network itself determines the, the optimal path for transmitting signals. So unlike an artificial neural network where the programmer has to develop an algorithm that optimizes how these synapses transmit the signals, in this case, the, the, the network itself 
in this case in the Natawire network itself self-regulates how the signal is transmitted across the network. And this is precisely the way in which we think the, new, the real neural network in our brains works in transmitting signals uh, between neurons and across the brain uh, itself. So by modeling the physics in these neuromorphic networks, we're, we're able to not only emulate some functionality that is starting to look much more brain-like than artificial intelligence, but um, it may also shed some new light into, into some of the research that's been done in neuroscience. So where are we heading with this type of uh, technology? So what we're interested in is thinking about some of the things that AI can't currently do and thinking about some of those capabilities that might be able to help us in the future in terms of machine intelligence. So there's a lot of ways in which machine intelligence could be smarter. For example, we already know that um, some of the data that AI uses is biased or compromised, and that's caused quite a lot of concern in, in the community. Um, secondly, we also know that um, there are also security and privacy concerns with some of the AI and machine intelligence methods that are used today. Everything gets done on the cloud in large data centers um, and uh, there's very little uh, control um, in terms of uh, privacy. And as I've mentioned, a, a very significant limitation with AI is that it's unable to adapt to changing information. So as soon as the input changes, you have to start from scratch and retrain um, the, the AI model. So these limitations and concerns really point to um, areas in which we can try and develop better tools and better techniques uh, that will help us to uh, overcome some of these problems and open up new avenues for new technologies that involve smarter machine intelligence. And in fact, one of the big goals, uh, for us at least, is thinking about the possibility of having smarter machine intelligence that can help humans, and in particular, help humans make decisions that are going to be ultimately better for the future of humanity. So for example, we can do a lot better at governance. Um, and there's a big question around whether future uh, intelligence in machines might be able to help us make unbiased decisions. We also know there are huge economic disparities around the world uh, and indeed even within, within cities. Um, can we see smarter machine intelligence in the future helping us to make uh, unbiased decisions that are going to make uh, things more equitable for cities and countries around the world? Sustainability is another related problem where, uh, again, decisions that are currently made are not being made in an equitable or indeed ethical way. Uh, and lastly, but not least, health is always going to be a priority for the future of humanity. So what is the role of smarter machines in the future for helping humans uh, improve health for everyone? So I'd like to end my presentation today with uh, one of my all-time heroes, Alan Turing, um, with this quote here. I believe that at the end of the century, which was for him the 20th century, the use of words and general educated opinion will have altered so much that one will be able to speak of machines thinking without expecting to be contradicted. I just want to finish by saying that Alan Turing was probably the first person to start thinking about ideas that ultimately became known as artificial intelligence. Unlike what today is known as artificial intelligence, his earliest ideas were around thinking about what the brain does and how it does it. How it, does it. Um, and uh, he contributed quite a lot to some of the early ideas around how to model neurons and how they talk to each other. So the neurons and their synapses and more importantly, how they're connected to each other in a network. 
So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me and I look forward to receiving and answering your questions. Thank you. And thanks very much, uh, Tadenka. That was uh, really fantastic. Um, I'm lucky uh, because I'm in the School of Physics and I get to see some of the talks that you do, but it always fascinates me uh, with this neural network uh, stuff. I just, it's, it's a lovely way of approaching physics and I really, I really love it. It's, um, yeah, it, I'm, I'm very impressed. Anyway. Thanks for your endorsement, Tom. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure that means so much to you. <laughs> um, uh, we have some questions uh, and I'd like to uh, throw those questions to you. Um, I'm going to start with a very simple one, Tadenka, if you don't mind. And that sure. is the AI that you had at the start with uh, cats, humans, hybrid things. Would the AI, AI recognise those uh, human cat pictures for, as cat or a human? Ah, so if that AI was trained to recognise cats, then it would be trying to see cats in those pictures of humans. So, um, so in other words, if you have an AI model, you can only train it to recognise one thing. So if then you feed it pictures of something else, it struggles to understand or interpret what those pictures are because it's been trained to recognise one thing. So if that one thing is cats, then when you show it a picture of a human, it, it's, it, it can't recognise humans. And in fact, it won't be able to recognise cats either. So that's why it kind of ends up being a mishmash of both of those two things. Uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to ask another couple of questions. But uh, before I do, I'd like to introduce, uh, sorry, um, encourage anyone else to ask some questions as well in the Q&A. Uh, there's a few coming up and I'll get to another one now. Is um, how did you get the network to self-regulate? Yeah, so I guess we didn't get it to do that. The self-regulation comes for free from the network topology. Um, and, and that's really important. So this is really the key to understanding the difference between the, the types of artificial neural networks that are used in AI. So they're software networks. Um, whereas, you know, when you move to something that's physical, that's really kind of trying to you know, emulate, build what's up here, um, then you can start to see how a real physical network might start to, to operate. So it's the network structure um, that really enables the uh, ad adaptability of uh, processing different types of information. So from what we've seen so far in our research, um, we think that having that type of complex network topology is really the key to realising general intelligence or natural intelligence, if you like, because of that adaptability. So a bit of a follow on from that as well is if they're doing this self-regulation, the uh, nanowire networks, does that mean that they're going to be self-regulating differently, therefore thinking differently? Absolutely. So, you know, if we think about all the participants in this webinar, um, there's I think 132 attendees and every one of us has a slightly different brain and we're processing the information that I've presented in slightly different ways as is reflected by all the different questions that come out. So in AI, that would actually be a disadvantage. But in fact, you know, general, in general intelligence, that, that is what defines general intelligence, to have these slight differences in the way in which information is being processed. And when you bring that all together, that actually creates more than you would get if you just uh, were trying to um, analyse data for a very specific task. Um, there's plenty of questions coming in, so I'm finding it difficult to find uh, to find some uh, uh, to fit them all in. So I'll just, I'm just going to keep going through. Sure. There's there's a question here. How how might we talk to such a nano nanotech network? What kind of like interface? Yeah, uh, look, that's a really output, great question, and that's actually something we're working on now. So some um, some AI models currently exist for speech recognition, so to recognise speech patterns. 
Um, and so we're actually trying to see if we can use this type of nanowire network to do exactly the same thing, to recognise speech patterns. But more importantly, what we're trying to see if we can do is not to just replicate what AI can do, that's not what this is about, is to try and see if you can do things that AI can't do. So, for example, if you have um, Siri or Alexa, um, it's, it's trained to recognise your voice, okay? Um, what if then you could recognise lots of different types of voices, lots of different intonations and so on? So again, it's all about that flexibility and adaptability. So we're trying to see if this type of uh, network, because of the network structure, is able to be more adaptable to a broader range of input signals, including the specific case of speech recognition. And of course, that generalises to other recognising other types of uh, information. So for example, uh, video information. And video is a really important um, example because video isn't just a static image, it's something that's continuously changing in time. And data that's continuously changing in time, so streaming data, is something that AI has a real problem with uh, working on. Um, so it's that dynamic um, type of data stream. Um, and so that's where we think this type of network is actually going to have an advantage. Um, because it's so adaptive and flexible, it can actually continuously adapt to changing input data. Okay, some more questions. Um, can, how can we make sure that the AI that we train uh, is not biased? Or kind of a similar question in a different way is about, you know, can you predetermine how the, the neural network is going to, uh, going to behave? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so the first question around bias, it's a really, it's a really important question actually. So, um, so at the moment, some of the problems that have arisen with, with, with AI and biases in, in AI um, are due to the fact that AI to work needs a lot of data. And the type of data that we bring to an AI model to make it work, that is where the biases are. That data is made by humans and it's brought to an AI model by humans. So um, the fact that that data has to be collated and uh, assessed by humans before it goes to an AI means that's where the problem is. That's where the biases occur. Uh, and we've seen a lot of problems with, with that um, um, in, in so many different uh, contexts. So, what if we had a way to process or analyse different types of data that didn't rely on big data? In fact, there are a lot of instances now and more and more cases now where a lot of the types of data that we have to deal with are not big. They're small data sets. They're continuously changing. They're what we call unstructured data. Um, and those types of data that are continuously changing, they don't have any definitive patterns in it. That's the type of data that AI fails at. So we actually don't have good ways in which to analyze small data that's continuously changing. So that, that is a big area um, that people are, are working on. Some of the big companies are working on that um, because we all have mobile phones and iPads and everything that are generating a lot of data locally um, and um, there's, a, an ins there's, a, there's a, a need to be able to process that data away from the cloud um, and without having to rely on big data as well. So biases come from um, large quantities of data that have been curated by humans. So um, if we can avoid that, then we can uh, mitigate this problem of bias. Uh, the second question was that predetermining. Can you can you oh, predetermine the, the structure or the yeah? The short answer to that is no. So this, I guess, is related to one of the earlier points. So um, for the same reason that no two brains are alike, every time we recreate this type of neural network, um, there's variations in it, and. Every time we are interested in using it to analyse some data, the output will be slightly different. 
Um, that doesn't mean that there's a problem, it just means we're going to get variations. And in some circumstances, those variations are good because we get different types of information from those variations in, in the output. So in that sense, it's non-deterministic, but we can collate all the outputs together to get you know, a general um, uh, uh, emergent um, uh, idea of, of what um, the, the ideal output should be. So AI has become um, a ubiquitously used phrase. If we wanted to use it in uh, communications or uh, with media or grant applications, etc., how can we present it differently uh, and use the term credibly without um, the purpose of what we're trying to do get lost in the hype? of the phrase? Yeah, look, that's a great question. And um, a lot of the time uh, where you see AI being used it's actually not. It's actually not using AI per se. Um, I think. I think the best thing to do is to actually have uh, some, you know, some really clear cut cases where it is absolutely essential or it makes sense to use AI. And and probably the only areas where you can put your hand on your heart and say this needs AI is where you do have a lot of data. Whenever you've got large quantities of data and that data has been annotated, which means humans have to go in and um, put some labels on it before it goes into an AI model, that needs to be done as well. So there's a pre-processing step. So if you've got large quantities of data, the quality of the data is good, then and only then should you be uh, warranted in using, using AI. Um, but as I mentioned before, in many cases, the data isn't big. So think about the types of data that's being generated, for example, by drones or satellites, um, you know, as they're monitoring uh, things, so all the video and imagery and um, all that kind of data, that's continuously changing. Um, and so there's a question mark around, you know, should you be using those types of data uh, models in those circumstances where you know the data is, is continuously changing. And in fact, for those particular examples as well, it's difficult for another reason. And that is because in those cases, sometimes it can be quite difficult to send data back and forth to the cloud. In some remote places or for reasons of privacy, you want to have whatever's collecting the data to be disconnected from the cloud. And so there you can't actually rely on um, the data center or cloud-based services to do the processing of the data. Um, so again, in those contexts, it doesn't make sense to say that you're going to use AI. Um, the, there's a really uh, simple question that I'd like to ask uh, now, and that is, you mentioned right at the start that one of the differences between the brain and uh, the work that you're doing is that the brain doesn't use algorithms. Mm. Um, does the, the network that you're building also not use algorithms? Um, or is, uh, I, I find that, I find that uh, fascinating that the brain doesn't use algorithms. Yeah. What's so, um, so first of all, when I say the brain doesn't use algorithms, that kind of refers to what you might find uh, being said a lot about the brain, which is, you know, how do we decode the brain, you know? Um, so all those references to computing in the context of the brain, in, in my opinion, it's the wrong way to think about how the brain is doing. The brain does not do that type of digital computation that we're familiar with um, when, when we use the word computing. So when I say there's no algorithm in the brain, I mean there's no computer algorithm in the sense of it's not doing digital computation. And in fact, what neuroscientists who kind of have this connection with that side of thing think is that it's more, it more closely resembles what's known as analog information processing. So instead of having digital bits, zero, one, and all the um, um, instructions that go with that, if, if, if A, then B, then do C and everything, instead of doing that, there are possibilities. So instead of saying, if A, do B, it might be, if A, you can either do B, C, D, or E. 
So it's quite different from just having an either or. You now have a range of possibilities in there. So, so we think that's probably more like how the brain is operating. There are multiple possibilities, which are, is quite different from the more deterministic type of digital computation that we're more uh, familiar with. Now, in our case, with this technology that we have, this neuromorphic uh, network, um, sure, we can just zap it with signals and watch it do its thing, and you know that's 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 fun. But in order to actually be able to use it to do some kind of um, analysis on data, maybe computing, then we need to implement that in some way. And this is another point of difference between. Um, our neuromorphic network and artificial neural networks. So in artificial neural networks, the programmer has to go in and make sure that the synapses by brute force computation are continuously being updated and optimised for that specific task that the neural network has been trained for. In our case, um, we don't do any of that. We let the, the network find the best way for those signals to be transmitted. But we want to get some output out of it. So we don't do anything to the network itself, but we read output from it. And we can adjust those outputs in order to train it to recognise a, a pattern of some kind. So there's still a training step in there but it's much, 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 much simpler than the type of training that's done for a, an artificial neural network where the network itself has to be trained. So the key difference is we don't need to train the network, we just train the output, we adjust the, the output, if you like. Okay, I'm gonna ask one more question and it's the obligatory question. Um, where do you see this technology in about five to 10 years time? Yeah, so I guess um, I'm interested in seeing it being used in, 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 the, in connected with a whole bunch of new technologies that are emerging now, which, as I mentioned before, are generating a whole lot of dynamically changing data. So um, there's a, so I think everyone's heard of 5G, either in, in a good context or a bad context. But the point is, one of the reasons why 5G um, is, is getting a lot of attention in the technology industry is because it's going to enable very high connectivity between a whole bunch of electronic devices, including cars. But, you know, cars, um, not just phones and iPads and computers, but things in our homes and so on. So the world is becoming increasingly connected. And this is what we call the internet of things, this high connectivity um, between devices that we as humans interact with on a daily basis. Those devices are continuously generating a whole bunch of data. There's absolutely no way as we go into the future that that data is gonna go up to the cloud and come back down in order to process that data. So a lot of the big tech companies are now looking to new ways to process that data locally on the device. Um, and that's, a, that term is often described as edge computing or edge devices, if you like. So as we move into the internet of things era, there are gonna be more and more of these type of devices and more and more of a need to process streaming data on the fly on these devices. And because more data is going to be generated that way, I think that we're even going to reach a point that we're not even going to bother to store that data. That data is just going to continuously stream and it exists one moment, it doesn't exist the next, but we want to analyse it on the fly. So the existing tools that we have at the moment with, with AI and machine learning can't handle that. Anything that's changing dynamically can't handle that. Um, and so, if that is going to be a reality for us in the future, all this streaming data, um, then we're going to need some new tools to analyse data on the fly. So that's where I see this, this going in, in five to ten years' time. Okay, um, that concludes our Lunchbox Science for this week. Thank you so much, uh, Zdenka. That was wonderful. A um, bunch of good questions. I appreciate all of that. Um, 
for everyone uh, watching, a recording of this talk will be uploaded to sydney.edu.au slash science in the next few days. Also would like to remind you of our next Lunchbox Science with Professor Mark Dads uh, on Wednesdays, July 1 from 12 p.m. And he'll be talking about what can a child's eye gaze tell us about pathways to mental health versus dysfunction. Uh, the registrations for that are now open at uh, sydney.edu.au slash science. Uh, so thanks once again to Zdenka and thanks all of you for attending. Um, have a great day. Thanks very much.